Welcome to Paranormal Almanac. With your host, Kurt Sandvig. That's right, I'm your host, Kurt Zambig, and on this week's edition of Paranormal Almanac, let's take a look at some of the other triangles out there. You'll get what I'm saying in a second, but first, as always, we have shout-outs. We have shout-outs to Aaron, Aaron, Ah, Monsters, Lauren and David, Alicia, Amber, Andrew, Angie, April, Ariel, Seth, Audra, Austin, Autumn, Bob, Brandon, Carolyn, Chuck, Cindy, Cole, Dan, Daniel, Devin, Dill, Dorian, Elliot, Erica, Aaron, Fabian, Harvey, Heidi, I, Isabel, J. Mark, Jade, Jaime, Jason, Jeff, Jeff, Jenny, Jennifer, Jared, Jerry, Joe, Joanne, John, Joshua, Juliana, Catherine, Kelsey, Kimberly, Kira, Kyle, Laura, 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 Rutho, Lauren, hey, howdy, hi. Lawrence, Leo, Lindsay, Lorraine, M. Caballero, Martin, Matt, Matt, Megan, Eric, Milo, Nanashi, Nick, Pablo, Paula, Rachel, Reed, Rosa, Sarah, Sarah, Sean, Shelly, Sonny, Suzanne, Todd, Jamie, and Elijah Hendrickson, Trey, Troy, and Veronica. And a very special shout out to Lauren McCune. She just got engaged over the uh, Christmas uh, holidays. So a very special shout out to Lauren McCune. Congratulations. I am so excited for you. Okay, let's get right into Paranormal News. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Paranormal News. Now, these first couple might not exactly be UFO or paranormal, but they're definitely interesting. There's something going on in Colorado right now, in northeastern Colorado. Back in uh, late December, eyewitnesses throughout northeastern Colorado had begun seeing formations of large drones. And I mean large, like three foot to six foot drones flying at night in complex grid-like patterns over rural areas and farmlands. Since then, the sightings have multiplied and the drones are beginning appearing in neighborhood Nebraska as well. So the local law enforcement, the FAA, the DEA, the U.S. Army, and the Air Force all have stated no knowledge of the drone activity or who is doing it. In fact, this, just this week, the FAA officially launched a task force, or just last week, the FAA officially launched a task force to identify the operators of the drones, which includes Colorado's most sophisticated surveillance aircraft. So these things are really becoming an interesting... Uh, These things are really becoming a problem for locals, and they're really bizarre. No one can figure out where they're coming from, who's doing them. But like I said, these aren't these normal-sized drones you'd throw up in the air. These are three to six feet across. They feature bright and strobing lights in various colors. And some of the odd things are that they can sit there and hover forever. They can descend very fast. They can take off very fast. They can go between 30 and 40 miles per hour, and they seem to know when they're being watched. One local person said that as soon as they took their phone out to take a picture of the drones that had been hovering in that area for over an hour, it turned off its lights and took off at a high speed. So they're trying to figure out who's doing it and why they're doing it. But for right now, these drones remain a mystery. Up next in paranormal news, origin of mystery of mystery, origin of mystery humming noise heard around the world may be uncovered. Now, this isn't that weird trumpet noise or humming noise that people just hear out in the mountains. I'm talking about the underwater one. I'm talking about the underwater humming that has been detected forever. They've been trying to figure out what they are, and they think they have an idea. They don't think it's UFOs. They don't think it's anything really mysterious. They think it's underwater volcanoes. It's a simple scientific explanation. An oceanographic campaign in May 2019 showed that a volcano had formed in the exact spot that the humming was at its loudest. So they think they figured out what this underwater humming is. It's nothing more than underwater volcanoes, ones that are being formed or ones that are becoming active. 
So I thought that was kind of interesting. I've talked about that a little bit a long time ago. Haven't really gone into a ton of detail on it, but but with a little research, they think they've figured out what has caused that. Okay, up next in paranormal news, definitely more paranormal. UFO sightings in America, North America that is, jumped to nearly 6,000 in 2019 alone. There was a rise in the number of North Americans who looked up in the sky and saw something they couldn't explain. The National UFO Reporting Center, which tracks calls and messages from people around the U.S. and Canada about strange sightings in the sky, reported that it received 5,971 sightings in 2019 alone. That's a jump from 3,395 in 2018. So all those people that are saying, how come we're not seeing UFOs anymore now that we have the technology to look up and take photos of them? Well, they're wrong. We are seeing UFOs, more and more, in fact. Peter Davenport, who runs the independent organization that's based in Davenport, Washington, I don't think they're any relation, said he wouldn't explain, or he couldn't explain, why more people call about seeing flashing white lights, fireballs, disc-shaped objects, or other oddities in 2019. One of the mysteries of ufology is there's a fluctuation in the number of reports over the years. Some years it's been really low, but it's gotten higher recently. To break down this report just a little bit, California led the country last year with the most number of UFO reports, 485 in total. That's an increase of 182 sightings from 2018. Florida was in second with 385, which is 156 more than 2018. And Washington came in third with 222 reports last year, increase of 51. So they're definitely going up. People are seeing more and more things. And he talks about one example. On April 15th, the man and his girlfriend reported they saw a formation in the sky near Bakersfield, California. We witnessed three unidentified objects, one in the middle being the largest, being the larger, escorted by two other smaller unidentified objects, one to the left and one to the right, having no lights and no sounds, and dark colored objects heading southeast at an unknown speed and disappeared into clouds beyond sight. So I know what you're thinking. I know a lot of you skeptics out there are saying, well, of course there are. That's because of drones. There's more drones in the sky. There's more of those little micro satellites being launched every day. Sure, but these are unidentified flying objects. They still fall right under that. And also, some of these descriptions aren't drones, not even three or six feet sized drones. They're something that people can't explain. They're huge. These objects are huge. They're in the sky. They're silent. And we don't know what they are. And they're urging people, if you see something in the sky, even if you don't know, like, I don't know what that is, that could be this, that could be that, I'm not sure. They're asking you to report it anyway. Just because you don't know what it is, that doesn't mean that someone else might not know. Someone might be able to identify it and figure out what it is. And if they can identify it, they can check that off the list as a known flying object, not an unknown flying object. And they said that'll definitely help them in the long run. Up next in paranormal news, swamp known for Bigfoot sightings being saved by North Carolina conservationists. A haunting Appalachian Mountain swamp well known to Bigfoot researchers has been purchased by a land conservancy in North Carolina for protection. Foothills Conservancy of North Carolina says it, says it closed on the 17 acres in Burke County in December with the help of money from a private donor. There have been multiple Bigfoot sightings in that area in recent years, so they thought it was really important to kind of conserve this and keep this so they can keep an eye on it. They say that uh, southern Appalachian mountain bogs are rare. At the highest elevations in Burke County, Jonas Ridge Bog is habitat to unique species of plants, animals, and insects, and possibly Bigfoot as well. Bigfoot 911, a Marion-based cryptid research group, told McClatchy News that eight Bigfoot sightings have been reported from around the Jonas Ridge area of Burke County in the last five years alone. And they say that the Southern Appalachian Mountain Bogs are a perfect fit for Bigfoot lore because they're often remote and less than thrilling places for people to visit. And that's a great spot for Bigfoot to flourish. And finally, on Paranormal News, Loch Ness Monster sightings reach record level. Unexplained sightings of something mysterious lurking in Loch Ness were at the highest level this century during 2019. A total of 18 sightings were recorded on the official Loch Ness Monster Sightings Register, which is the highest since 1983. Now, they range from eyewitness accounts by visitors to the area to unusual objects spotted by people on the other side of the world scouring images on a live webcam of the loch. The entries also include a sighting by seriously ill Zachary White, age 5. I talked to you guys about him before. He's freaking awesome. Gary Campbell, who keeps the register, believes there were various reasons for the bumper number of 
for the bumper number of reported sightings. The availability of the webcam has given more and more people the chance to look at the lock, and there have been, re there have been record numbers of people visiting the area and its attractions, including the castle. In the connected digital world we live now, people are taking photos and sending them to us. They want to know what it is, and then they're reporting it to us. It was also the year when the world's media reignited massive interest in Nessie after, after descending on the area to hear the results of a survey led by researchers from New Zealand who tried to catalog all the species in Loch Ness by extracting environment DNA from water samples. So hopefully we have increased... So basically... To wrap up paranormal news, we got increases in UFO sightings. We have increases in Loch Ness sightings. And I gotta say, between that and them saving the land for the Bigfoot, it's a pretty damn good year. And I gotta say, despite everything that's happening in the world, with Australia being on fire, with volcanoes going off everywhere, we gotta look for the positives. And the positives are, in 2019, we saw an increase in UFOs, increase in Loch Ness monster sightings, even though it's not a monster, it's Nessie. We had an increase in stitch barking, apparently. It's all right, pal. Don't worry about it. And we have an increase in the paranormal alone. People are more interested in UFOs, in aliens, in the cryptids, in everything. So I'll take whatever little good news I can get in this world. And while I'm talking about it, I want to thank everybody that's donated to help save Australia. The horrific fires that are still going on in Australia. So everybody that donated... I cannot thank you enough. It means the world to me that you guys have given some money to it. I gave some money to it. Everybody listening, if you have, it just everybody listening gave $1 to help save Australia, that'd be hundreds of thousands of dollars. That'll go a long way. So if you haven't and you want to and you don't know what links or where to go, I put a couple of links on the Facebook page. Please go and check those out. Please do what you can to help save the animals and the people and everybody in Australia right now. All righty, thank you so much. That about does it for Paranormal News. Let me take a quick break. We'll be right back with the topic at hand. Okay, we are back. And like I said earlier, this is all about triangles. Different triangles. Because as you guys know, the Bermuda Triangle is the number one triangle. Whether it's real or not, I'll get into in a second. But there are other triangles out there in the world, and I wanted to talk about those lesser-known triangles. All right, but before we get to those, like I just said, not everything that was written or said about the Bermuda Triangle is real. For an example, just a quick example, I'm not going to get into everything that's wrong with the Bermuda Triangle and its paranormal properties, but let's just go with one example, the Mary Celeste. One of the biggest, best examples of a mystery within the Bermuda Triangle. Now, in case you guys didn't know, the Mary Celeste was found intact in Portugal and did not disappear without a trace within the Bermuda Triangle itself. Sure, it was found at sea intact with no crew in it, but the rest of the ghost ship stuff is pure BS. Here is the quickest recap possible of that whole Mary Celeste thing, okay? So the ship began its voyage on November 7th, 1872, sailing with seven crewmen, Captain Benjamin Spooner Briggs, his wife Sarah, the couple's two-year-old daughter Sophia. They were all on board when the ship hit heavy weather for two weeks straight while trying to reach the Azores. Now this is where the ship's log's last entry was recorded at 5 a.m. on November 25th, 1872. Then, 10 days later, the De Gracia crewmen, it's a ship, another ship, came across an empty Mary Celeste. They went on board. They were like, where the hell is everybody? The pump was disassembled. The lifeboat, gone, and not a trace of the crew. They determined she was still sailable, so they sailed the ship 800 miles to Gibraltar. Now, the leading theory as to why they abandoned ship is complicated, but basically, they had a faulty pump in the ship. They had a faulty chronometer, and they had hit rough storms. And I mean torrentially rough storms. The captain probably abandoned the ship because he was concerned the Mary Celeste had taken on too much water, and they were near enough land just then, so abandoning ship was the best logical thought based on the facts they had at hand. He didn't know that the ship was still fine. He knew they were taken on water. He knew the pump was broken. They tried to take it apart. They tried to fix it. So he's like, you know what? 
I, I can't be sure that we're going to make it. Let's abandon ship. So they all abandoned ship for land because they had just passed land right then. It was the best possible way, the best course of action for an experienced sailor like himself. So yeah, even though the Mary Celeste was found floating unmanned in the triangle, there is a very real leading scientific theory of as to why. And there's nothing supernatural about it. So a lot of these stories, they have a kernel of truth. The Mary Celeste found abandoned, was a ghost ship floating there. That's all true. But if you go just an inch farther into the story, go down that rabbit hole just a little bit more, you'll find a very rational and reasonable explanation as to why. Okay, so with that said, let's take a deeper look at some other mysterious triangles around the world, and we'll see if we can debunk any of those. I'm going to guess I can. All right, first up, we have the Bridgewater Triangle. And the first thing I really found out about this one, it's not triangular shaped at all. Like, not even remotely triangular shaped. It's more like the Bridgewater Blob... Ooh, the Bridgewater Blob Angle. Copyright Paranormal Almanac. So this Bridgewater Blob Angle, mysterious things happen all in and around this blob, but let's get to where it is first. The Bridgewater Blob Angle is mostly in Massachusetts. It's 200 square miles wide, long, big, whatever, however you want to say it. It's 200 square miles. It's huge. It's big. Now, it was coined in the 1970s by cryptozoologist Lauren Coleman. He said the triangle is made up of the towns of Abington. Oh, crap. I forgot to look this up. Hold on. We have to look up how to say a name so I don't screw it up and get yelled at by people. Okay. Let's find out together how to say this. Rehoboth. 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 All righty. So we're going to say Rehoboth. Okay. Let's get back to this story. So it's, I know how to say it now. The triangle is made up of the towns of Abington, Rehoboth, and Freetown. And I'm sure it's pronounced Freeton, but whatever. It's Freetown. But the more research you do, the more you find out that a lot of the mysterious things fall outside these towns, which led me to that whole blob angle thing. It is not a clear line. It's not everything's in the center of this triangle. In fact, there is so much to this blob angle, but a lot of it is inside the largest swamp in Massachusetts. Now, this swamp is 5,000 acres, and people can easily get lost in it. And, I mean, they do get lost in it quite a bit all the time. So let's start there. It's called the Hockamock Swamp. And the Hockamock Swamp was originally called that by the Algonquin, and it means the place where spirits dwell. So what did the white settlers call it? Did they call it the place where spirits dwell? Nope, they called it the Devil's Swamp. And I'll get to why they called it that in a second. The uh, Hockamock Swamp is occasionally referred to as Hobomock, and the Wampanoag worshipped and feared Hobomock, which is the chief deity of death and disease. So we got Hobomock, chief deity of death and disease. We've got the Hockamock, meets the place where spirits dwell. But that Hobomock composed of human souls of the dead. And he was known to congregate in areas like the Hockamock Swamp. So modern archaeologists have determined that there, we, there is, was, whatever you want to call it, an 8,000-year-old burial ground in the swamp. So, we know it was a Native American burial ground. And we know that stupid settlers messed with it and either built upon or messed with the Native American burial grounds, which, you know, is a recipe for a paranormal disaster. So the reason they called it um, the Devil's Swamp is because they saw spirits in there all the time. Now, the swamp itself could be an entire episode. There's been so much activity within it, so I'm not going to go through everything, but I'm going to go through the highlights of the swamp. Not surprisingly, since it's so dense, both cell phones and GPS are very spotty, and again, it causes a lot of people to get lost in there, even to today. So what's actually seen in the swamp? Well, Bigfoot, and a lot of them. Reports of large, hairy men, large, hairy gorillas, Orangutans, giant bears have all been reported in the swamp for decades. And I mean, by decades, I mean like for a hundred years, if not more. In fact, for two days and nights in 1970, the state police used search dogs to try and find a huge giant bear in the swamps, even though no bears lived in the area. People were calling the police station to report a seven foot tall bear or creature, and police were convinced it had to be a bear but they never found it. In 1978, 
A half-man, half-ape creature was seen in the swamp. Now, the witnesses said, I was standing there, and for some reason I had to turn around. It was a chill or something inside me, and I turned around, and there, off to the right, maybe 200 yards away, there was this, well, I don't know what it was. It was a creature that was all brown and hairy, like a big, apish man, and it was making its way for the woods. But I didn't stick around to watch where it was going. I ran for the street. Now, another person canoeing in the swamp saw a huge hairy beast, too. In fact, in October 24th, 1980, there was a local newspaper report of a Brockton man and his friend paddling on Lake Nipponicket. Sure. When they came across what looked like a smallish orange orangutan sitting on the island. Now, another report, also in 1980, was when a fur trapper was canoeing in the swamp when he saw, th when he saw something huge on the water's edge crashing through the brush and out into the river. He said, I knew it wasn't a human because when I passed by, because when it passed by me, I could smell it. It smelled like a skunk, musty and dirty, and it was only a few yards away. So this guy had a very up close encounter with a Bigfoot right there in the Hockamock swamps. In 2009, a law enforcement agent reported finding huge tracks in the snow 10 miles from the swamp and seemingly coming out of the swamp itself. So like I said, these reports aren't all in the past. They're very recent as well. Now, again, I'm going to go real quickly through all these because there's a lot in the Hockamock Swamp. But from Bigfoot, let's go to cattle mutilations. In 1998, two animal mutilations were reported. The first was a single cow found mutilated in the woods. Now, I couldn't find out a ton of details about it, but apparently the body was mutilated, but not eaten by the animals at all. Another incident was a group of calves found mutilated in a clearing. Now, people were so scared by the brutality of these mutilations that they thought a cult was responsible for it. Now, this led to a ton of sites to say that a demonic cult was discovered living in the swamps, but it was just because of this last mutilation, the calves mutilations, and I couldn't find any, and I mean any, reputable source for a cult living in the swamp ever. So that one, that one's bullshit. Again, there's that kernel of truth, the calf mutilations. There were a bunch of calves and they were really mutilated, but that's just, people were like, oh my God, it must be a cult. No cult was ever found. And there's also ghosts too, because many people have reported seeing the same hitchhiking ghost on a road in the swamp area. They say they're driving down Route 44 and in Rehoboth when they see a redheaded hitchhiker. And now when they pull over to either help them or look in their rearview mirror to be like, what the hell is this guy doing hitchhiking nowadays? They say he's gone. As soon as they pass by him, that guy disappears. And there's a lot of reports about that guy as well. Whether they're all real or if it's just become like a local urban legend, I'm not really sure. So take that one with a grain of salt. Now, then there are UFO reports as well, going all the way back to March 1st, 1639. You heard that right, all the way back to 1639. One of the oldest possible UFO sightings in America. A man named John Winthrop, who was the governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, kept a diary of early settlers' life back then. Now, he wrote down a tale he had heard firsthand from one of his settlers. That man was named James Everell. Now, he noted, as being, he noted James as being a sober, discreet man. He and two others had been rowing a boat in the muddy river when they saw a light in the night sky. When it stood still, it flamed up and was about three yards square, the governor wrote. When it ran, it was contracted into the figure of a swine. Now, I have no idea what that means. I just, I think he means it blurred out. You know, it became a big blob blur of light in the sky. So over the course of two to three hours, not minutes, hours, the boatman said the mysterious light ran as swift as an arrow, darting back and forth between them and the village of Charleston. It's a distance of about two miles. Diverse other credible persons saw the same light after about the same place. So what he's saying is they had more witnesses to this light than just these three guys. People from Charleston, as well as other places, saw these lights as well, or saw this light as well. Finally, when the UFO faded away or blinked out, depending on where you get your info, the three men in the rowboat were one mile further upstream than they had remembered with no knowledge of how it happened. Now, that sounds a lot like lost time to me, but they're watching this thing for an hour or two to three hours. They're freaked out. They're seeing this light. 
they're probably not paying attention to the current kind of sweeping them upstream. So I don't know if that's exactly lost time and they were just put back into their boat. I don't, I'm just not sure about that one. Anyhow, five years later, January 18th, 1644, another entry was entered in his diary. Now, for full disclosure, I can't find a copy of this journal that I can read myself. I'm just, I'm just going based on reputable sites. And a lot of the sites seem to quote this same journal. I would actually like to see a, you know, a digital copy that I could read myself, but I'll keep looking for that. And if I find it, I'll definitely, you know, do an update on a future episode. Anyhow, January 18th, 1644, about midnight, three men coming in a boat to Boston saw two lights arise out of the water near the north point of the town cove in form like a man, and it went at a small distance to the town and so to the south point and there vanished away. And about a week later, Winthrop wrote, another occurrence happened over the Boston Harbor. A light like the moon arose about the northeast point in Boston and met the former of Noddles Island. And there they closed in one and then parted and closed and parted diverse times and so went over the hill in the island and vanished. Sometimes they shot out flames and sometimes sparkles. This was about eight o'clock in the evening and was seen by many. About the same time, a voice was heard upon the water between Boston and Dorchester. Dor I don't know, Dorchester. Look, New England people, you correct it as I say it. I don't know. And calling out in a most dreadful manner, boy, boy, come away, come away. And it suddenly shifted from one place to another a great distance about 20 times. It was heard by diverse godly persons. About 14 days after, the same voice in the same dreadful manner was heard by others on the other side of the town towards Noddles Island. Now, Winthrop had a theory as to what that voice was. He said that near that location, a vessel captained by John Chaddock had exploded months earlier after a sailor accidentally ignited gunpowder aboard the ship. Now, the captain was not on board at the time, but the blast killed five crew members. So Winthrop thinks he has an idea of who that is. He said that the, rescues, the rescuers had recovered the bodies of all the victims except for one man, the man they thought was responsible for everything. He was a sailor who told the others he had the ability to communicate with the dead and was suspected with murdering his master in Virginia. Supposedly, according to Winthrop, it was his voice that shouted to them when they saw the UFO. I know that's a really convoluted story. You got to really kind of read into that or re-listen to this a few times to really grasp it. But a lot of people were hearing a booming voice and a light. Winthrop goes, I know what that voice was. I know exactly who it was. It was that one, so it was that one sailor who disappeared. We couldn't find his body. He always said he could communicate with the dead. He was suspected of murdering his master back in Virginia. So that's the voice they heard shouting to them when they saw the UFO. So is that a UFO ghost? Like a one-two punch of a UFO ghost? Or was it just his ghost? Or was his ghost on the UFO? Or was it even a UFO at all? Could it just have been the ghost of this sailor because they could never find his body and this guy was always talking about communicating with the dead so he's a little bit off anyway? No idea, but it's a weird one, and it was written by a man that seems sane. Everything else I could read about this guy said he's a normal guy. He had a really detailed journal. Again, I can't personally find it, but I'm sure it's out there to be found. So, weird one, right? Two for two. Either two UFO encounters or two UFO encounters with the ghost. I don't, I'm not exactly sure. Alrighty, so let's jump ahead a little bit. Halloween night, 1908, when two undertakers on their way from West Bridgewater to Bridgewater said they saw a giant glowing lantern in the sky. Now, they watched it hover for nearly 40 minutes, and they said it had swirling lights to it, and it was right above the swamp near the Rainman Taunton Greyhound Park. So it sounds to me, anyway, like they saw a UFO as well over the swamp. I'm going to pause right here to say... I got a couple more glowing things, but I'm going to pause right here to say a lot of skeptics say only thing they're seeing is swamp gas. Sure, swamp gas is real. It does happen. But swamp gas doesn't zigzag from one spot to another and back. Swamp gas doesn't come rising out of the water, shoot towards people, then go up into the sky and disappear. Swamp gas is just that. It's gas. It ignites. It looks really glowy, weird-looking lights. 
but it doesn't last for as long as these people are seeing it. So for the skeptics, yes, it might have been swamp gas, but to me personally, these stories don't sound like swamp gas. Alrighty, let's go to 1968. Several witnesses saw a large orb floating in the trees in the woods of Rehoboth. Then in the 1970s, there were a bunch of UFO sightings reported in local newspapers. In 1976, two UFOs were seen by witnesses to land along Route 44 in Taunton. Then in 1994, a Bridgewater policeman reported seeing a UFO in the town of Rainman. There was a 1979 UFO sighting case over Route 24 by two WHDH radio reporters. Then Courtney Cullen says that she saw a UFO in the summer of 1999 while at a cookout in Bridgewater near Lake Nippenicket, which, as you can probably guess, is part of the Hockamock Swamp. Okay, so she said, suddenly there was this noise, wicked loud. So you know she's, you know she's from New England. She said, wicked loud. Suddenly there was this noise, wicked loud. And then there were lights in the sky, no color, but just bright lights. They were descending fast, like coming straight at the house behind where we were at the cookout. And just as it seemed that the lights were going to crash into the house, they darted sideways at this unbelievable speed, and soon they just disappeared. But what I also remembered is that soon after we saw the lights, more than one helicopter appeared in the sky in the area of where the lights were. Then in 1997, UFOs were spotted along Route 44. A law enforcement officer working the night shift in Bridgewater saw a very large, and I mean really large, triangular UFO with three white and two red star-like lights. In fact, every decade, there are a bunch of UFO reports above and around the swamps, with the later ones always being followed by black helicopters. I think that is very important. A lot of people say, oh, there's a UFO, and the only thing they're seeing is a hovering helicopter. But this woman, she said, Courtney Cullen said, I saw these lights, it was really weird. As soon as they disappeared, they darted sideways at this unbelievable speed. They just disappeared. And then one helicopter appeared in the sky right where the lights were. So she can differentiate between a UFO and a helicopter. I'm pretty damn sure this law enforcement officer is just as capable as her, especially when his looked nothing like a helicopter. His was a ginormous triangular UFO with three white and two red star-like lights. These people know what they're looking at. They're not looking at a helicopter. They're not looking at planes. They're not seeing swamp gas. They're seeing things that are moving at unbelievable speeds and angles, and they know what they're not. They're rational enough to go, it's not a helicopter. It's not an airplane. It's not a blimp. It's not swamp gas. It's something else, and I don't know what it is. Okay, other things that are reported in the swamp. There are ghost or phantom drumming noises that seem to come from everywhere and nowhere at the same time. Giant anaconda-like snakes. Puckwudgies, which are tiny wild men. Just think of like little troll looking guys. Ghosts of Native Americans, some standing there, some hunting, and some paddling canoes down the river. Bridgewater State University campus is said to be haunted. In fact, um, Shea Durgan, she Durgan, dorm room 228, and the auditorium, which is said to receive visits from mischievous ghosts named George, who plays with the stage lights and the sounds, are all the haunted hot spots. So, for the longest time, since the settlers, people have been seeing ghosts. Most of the ghosts, especially in the settlers' time, were ghosts of Native Americans. There is something going on with this swamp. It is insane. But before I move out of the swamp to talk about the rest of the triangle, because this is only a part of that triangle, there's one more thing spotted there. In 1971, a Norton police officer said he saw a giant dinosaur-like bird fly up and out of the swamp. Now, he estimated the wingspan to be between 8 and 12 feet long, and it was leathery or scaly. Now, he said he got a good look at it, and this wasn't a flash or something big flying. He said he could see the long beak, the teeth, the leathery wings of this dinosaur. Fun fact, I'm sure you guys already know this, the local Native Americans used to talk about Thunderbirds being in that exact area. So maybe one of these Thunderbirds, these pterodactyls or whatever you want to call them, still survived at least into the 1970s. Okay, I can safely say that is the most I have ever spoken about a haunted swamp. 
So let's move on to other parts of the blob angle. Let's talk a little bit about profile rock. It's a 50 foot tall rock formation that looks like the profile of a Native American. But this isn't a natural formation. It was probably caused by dynamite in the 1800s. Now some visitors to profile rock claim to have seen a ghostly figure of a man sitting on the rock. And grain of salt time, according to local legend, Native American tribes people had warrior ghost dancers perform ceremonial dances on the rock. My problem with that is this. It's not a natural formation. We know it was caused by dynamite probably in the 1800s. So I don't know about this local legend about, oh yeah, tribes people had ghost dancers performing ceremonial dances on this rock, which didn't look anything like a profile of a Native American at that time. Now, unfortunately... You can't visit Profile Rock anymore because on June 19th, 2019, approximately 9.22 a.m., the Freetown Police Department, along with the Freetown Fire Department, responded to the Freetown State Forest Profile Rock Park for a report of recent damages to the historic rock formation. First responders and park officials discovered that a large portion of the rock formation had broken off, and that face is gone. So... I don't know what to think about Profile Rock. I gotta be honest, it sounds to me like someone saw something once. Someone saw a ghost of a figure of a man sitting on the rock. Because it looks like a Native American, they always throw in these, oh well, Native American legends say that for a long time this profile would come alive and kill blah 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 blah. No. That's just us trying to add spooky stuff to it. That's that local urban legend bullshit that always pops up around these kind of weird formations. All right, now, since that's gone, let's move on to another rock. This one's called Dighton Rock. But since I already talked about Dighton Rock on a previous episode, here's the quick recap only. Dighton Rock is a 40-ton boulder that was discovered in the Taunton River. I'm assuming it's Taunton and not Tauntaun. If it's Tauntaun, that's a way cooler name for a river. But I'm going to guess it's Taunton. Again, New Englanders, I'm sure I'm butchering these names. I'm sure it's now Freetown. I'm sure it's Freeton or something. I'm not wicked smart, okay? So they discovered in the Taunton River, Taunton River of Berkeley, Massachusetts. Now this rock, this Dighton rock. So they find this thing in 1690. The reason this rock stands out is because of its mysterious markings. These markings are seemingly inconsistent with any particular writing style. The origins of the rock have baffled everybody. Throughout the years, a number of theories have been floated as to who created this cryptic inscription on the rock. One of the most popular theories is that these markings are Norse in origin. Now, this theory says that uh, the rock was a portrayal of a Viking voyage into the area as early as 1000 AD. And that's the one that I believe. I truly do believe that the Vikings made it to North America. I think it's pretty much been confirmed by now that the Vikings made it this far. Another popular theory about Dighton Rock suggests that the markings are the work of Native Americans. There was a significant population of Native Americans in the area when the rock was found, and similar markings have been found and attributed to various Native American tribes across the Northeast. Other theories are that the markings are ancient Phoenician, or Portuguese, or Chinese. So, we don't really know that much about Dighton Rock. It is a mystery. To me, though, all signs lead to the Vikings. Alright, so that about wraps it up for the very first triangle in this story. If you guys knew that much about the Bridgewater Triangle, you knew way more than I did because I had to research a hell of a lot of this. The Bridgewater Triangle, or Bridgewater Blob Angle, as we now know that's what it should be called, is really interesting, and there are way more stories. Like I said, I could have done a whole episode on just this one, but I wanted to do an episode about a bunch of triangles. So let's move on to the next one. And the next one is the Bennington Triangle. It's not very far from this other triangle. This one's located in southwestern Vermont and home to a lot of ghost towns. In fact, the town of Glastonbury... Ah, let's see how to pronounce that. I don't want to say everything wrong today. Glastonbury. Glastonbury. Okay, fine. The town of Glastonbury within the triangle had a population of eight. That's right. Population of eight in 2010. So yeah, not a lot of eyewitnesses to this one. There are a ton of ghost towns just like Glastonbury in the area within this triangle. So, this is a very sparsely populated triangle. 
Okay, so this triangle was coined by New England author Joseph Citro during a public radio broadcast in 1992. So it's relatively new to the triangle game, and this one seems to be largely about missing people. Because between 1945 and 1950, five people disappeared in the Bennington area. One, a very experienced hunter, had taken four others out on a hunting trip, and he got ahead of them just a little bit. When they caught up to where he should have been, he had disappeared completely. All they ever found was one rifle cartridge of his, and the other four hunters, well, they made it back safely. Then a hiker disappeared. Then, three years to the day of that one, another hiker disappeared. Then, an eight-year-old boy went missing after his mom left him alone for an hour, which, I'm sorry, but these are woods. You can't leave a boy alone for an hour. Especially an eight-year-old boy. Now, grain of salt time. Bloodhounds followed his scent back to the exact same spot that they had stopped three years earlier for one of those hikers, when they were searching for one of those other hikers. I don't really buy that. That sounds too creepy pasta to me, but there's a lot of sites that say that that is exactly what happened. So, I'll add it to the list. Then a woman and her friend were walking along the river, and now she slipped in and she slipped and fell in the river and told them she would go back to get fresh, dry clothes. So it wasn't like she slipped in the river and was rushed downstream. She slipped in the river. She was like, ah, crap. You know what? I'm going to go back. I'm going to get some fresh, dry clothes. Go on without me. Well, she was declared missing because when he got back to camp, she wasn't there. An extensive search of the area was done with over 300 people and aircraft, but they couldn't find her body at all. Then, strangely, seven months later, her body was located in the exact area the extensive search was done. Now, her body was the only one ever found from these disappearances. So this triangle, already starting off kind of weird, but this triangle also has a huge black killer dog that in 1976 was seen by firefighter Philip Kane, who said it had ripped the throats out of two of his ponies and terrorized the area for several weeks. Here's the thing about this one, though. I couldn't find any newspaper articles about it. I would think this would be a bigger story, but again, apparently it wasn't. Then in 1993, there were a series of reports of a large, light, tan cat the size of a Great Dane. Now, this was dubbed the Mansfield Mystery Cat. There is a newspaper article about this one, though. Wildlife expert said Wednesday that a big cat on the loose in eastern Massachusetts may be a hybrid jungle cat native to northern Africa. Remember, this is from 1993. This is not a wild mountain lion or a cougar, said Dr. Charles Sedgwick, director of the Wildlife Clinic at Tufts University in Medford, Massachusetts. The animal, originally thought to be a mountain lion, was first spotted on March 12th. It has been sighted repeatedly since then in three towns south of Boston. At least two sightings were reported Wednesday in Mansfield. It's certainly not a huge cat. The jungle cat is popular with people who like to hybridize wild cats with domestic cats, Sedgwick said. Cedric says the physical traits of the cat match those of the jungle cat, long body, short legs, fluffy tails with rings, fluffy tail with rings, and a blocky head. State environmental police were using dogs and setting traps in an effort to catch the animal, which authorities believe weighs between 20 and 30 pounds. So that's a big cat. Local residents have named the cat Sylvester the Mystery Cat, and opportunists have begun selling t-shirts with drawings of a cougar reading, I survived cougar country. The cat has been blamed for maiming ducks and stealing chickens, but Sedgwick is unlikely. But Sedgwick said it is unlikely this animal is dangerous. It's something that might kill a puppy or a kitten, but it's certainly not going to take someone's dairy cow down, he said. Still, he advised residents not to corner the animal because it could get violent if scared. Sedgwick said it is likely an owner lost the cat and is reluctant to report it missing. The state and federal governments require licenses for jungle cats and other exotic animals, and Sedgwick said Sylvester's owner probably doesn't have one. If caught, Sedgwick said the animal will probably be taken to a feline retirement community for wild and hybrid cats in captivity. So yeah, apparently there's a very large cat running around in this part of the triangle. Now, UFOs have also been spotted in the triangle. In fact, few of the UFOs were actually spotted by the searchers looking for those missing people I told you about just a couple of minutes ago. Now, a local legend says that three of the missing people were wearing red, and it's bad luck to wear red within the triangle. Dun, dun, dun. 
Okay, that's about it for that one. Again, these are just in a nutshell, but that's about it for that one. Let's move on to another triangle. It's called the Dragon's Triangle, also known as the Devil's Sea. Now, this is a proper triangle. It's in the Pacific Ocean, just off the coast of Japan. One corner of the triangle in Taiwan, second corner in the Japanese island of Mayaki Jima, Mayaki Jima, and the third corner of the triangle in the island of Iwo Jima. Now, as you would expect from an ocean triangle, this one has numerous ship disappearances, numerous UFO sightings, and a ton of magnetic anomalies. It's just like the Bermuda Triangle here. Now, before I tell you about these, there are a lot of sites that say the Devil's Triangle is on the opposite side of the Earth as the Bermuda Triangle. That if uh, someone was to like travel from the center of the Bermuda Triangle straight through the planet in a straight line, they would end up in the center of the other triangle. And all of these sites say, but there's no way to test that. So I tested it because it's really fucking easy to test it. I went to the Antipodes map. It's a site that you can go to. You type in where you are and the Antipodes map shows you exactly what's on the opposite side of the earth from you. It's neat. It's fun. You'll get bored with it in five minutes. But I went to the Antipodes map. I entered in the Bermuda Triangle. And what's on the opposite side of the world from it? Is it the Devil's Triangle? No. It's just to the west of Australia. So no. No, it's not the exact opposite side of the Bermuda Triangle. Stop saying that, stupid sight. It's real easy for you to check that. I checked it in like two minutes. Okay. Let's get to what is inside the Dragon's Triangle. Or Devil's Sea, or Devil's Triangle, or however you want to say it. Let's start a long time ago, in 1274, when Kublai Khan attempted to invade Japan twice, in the years 1274 and 1281. Now, he tried to cross the Devil's Triangle, the Di Dragon's Triangle, the Devil's Sea, whatever you want to call it, both times, and lost numerous ships, as well as about 40,000 crew members. He apparently encountered deadly typhoons right in the Triangle. Now, divers and archaeologists can confirm they found a bunch of Mongol ships in the Triangle. So that part is technically true. Then, in 1803, sailors noticed an unusual ship sailing in the Triangle that looked like a hollowed-out, box-shaped boat that really resembled a traditional Japanese ship that was used for burning incense. They said the woman sailing it was odd-looking, but not much more info. In fact, some sites say she was foreign, Others say she had a very uncommon physical appearance, whatever that means. Even though a lot of people witnessed her and her odd look and her ship, they lost sight of her and she was never seen again. In the 1940s and 50s, several fishing boats went missing in these waters. There was also five Japanese military ships that were lost along with more than 700 crew members. So a lot of people do die in the Dragon's Triangle. So, 1952... A Japanese military vessel called the Kayu Maru No. 5, which is way less catchy than the Mambo No. 5, was sent out to investigate what was happening to the ships in the Triangle. No big surprise, guess what happened to the Kayu Maru No. 5? Well, it and its crew of 31 people were never seen again. Alright, so let's get to a little bit of a scientific explanation for what's going on. The best explanation for so many ships going down in the area is methane hydrates. And that's just like in the Bermuda Triangle. Methane hydrate ice turns into gas when the water reaches above 64.4 degrees Fahrenheit. When the methane hydrate gas explodes, it causes bubbles to form on the surface of the water, causing interruptions into the buoyancy of the water, which can easily sink a ship. And they come out of nowhere. These bubbles come up, suck the ship down, gone. And it completely dismantles the ships on their way down. Also, if the gas is exposed to an open flame, it'll suddenly explode. Another explanation actually explains the name of the triangle itself, because there are many legends going back hundreds, if not thousands of years, that dragons live under the waters there, hence Dragon's Triangle. Now, when these dragons get angry, large waves take ships out. Well, guess what is under these waters there? Underwater volcanoes. Very interesting, right? But underwater volcanoes 
do not explain this next eyewitness testimony. In 1944, a Japanese pilot was in battle against the U.S. forces when he noticed something terrifying under the water below him. The pilot said he saw a large sea monster in the water as he flew over the Devil's Sea. The serpent-like monster was said to have had two large triangular-shaped wings and was swimming very fast while keeping its head above the water. The pilot estimated that the creature was around 150 feet in length. I obviously have no explanations as to what he could have saw. He was an experienced pilot. He knew the area well. Sure, he was in battle, so his adrenaline was pumping and he was probably freaking out a bit. But just because your adrenaline is pumping and you're freaking out a little bit because you're being shot at doesn't mean you start hallucinating 150 foot long dragon monster things with large triangular shaped wings swimming under the ocean. I have no idea what to say about that one. Not surprisingly, UFOs and ghost lights are seen in the area too, and I mean a lot of them. But they're all basic UFO reports, so you can imagine what they sound like because it's time to move on to another triangle. That's right, there's even more triangles in this episode. The next one is called the Matlock Triangle. That's right, Matlock Triangle, located in the Derbyshire. Nope, I gotta look that one up because I don't want to get yelled at. Derbyshire. 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 Really? That's dumb. Derbyshire. It's, it says Derbyshire, but apparently it's Derbyshire. Okay, let's do this. The Matlock Triangle, located in the Derbyshire Dales, is known as the UFO capital of the world. That's right, this triangle is all UFOs. Hundreds of UFO sightings in this triangle. Now, it definitely makes this one the number one UFO triangle for this episode. So, residents of Derbyshire Dales, please wait by your mailbox for your award as the number one UFO triangle of this episode. And if I do have any uh, listeners from Derbyshire Dales, just let me know. Maybe I'll send you out something. So, UFOs of every kind have been spotted here. Disc-shaped UFOs, orb UFOs, cigar-shaped UFOs, even one shaped like a bowler hat. This is another place that has a sighting I already talked about on a past episode. Strange ghost planes, or a bunch of sightings of one ghost plane, were seen in this triangle. I mean, a bunch of people claim to have seen a ghost plane flying through Derbyshire in late March 2018. But like I said, I already talked about that on a previous episode. So if you don't remember that one, hit pause right here. Go back, listen to every episode I've done, including the patron episodes. So if you're not a patron, you have to become a patron. Go back and listen to every episode I've done. I've done, And then when you're done with that and you actually have found the episode where I talked about these ghost planes, then you press play and you can listen to the rest of this. Or don't and just continue listening. I don't care. So these ghost planes were sighted in the Peak District, as well as Ripley, Hilton, Belper, Matlock, and Ashbourne. Iris Robinson from Belper said they were flying ever so low. They were dark colored, but they went so quick you couldn't see anything else. Now, skeptics say people were seeing an American Hercules transport plane, but without any reason or explanation as to why they think people were seeing those. So yeah, ghost planes, check that off the list. Moving on to the next thing. Sharon Rowlands, or Rowlands, saw a giant, silent, moving, colorful disc hovering over her village. Now, she even caught it on video with her camcorder, but she sold the footage to a TV show for 20 grand. And I can't blame her, it's 20 grand. She said, I was filming it from around two miles away. It resembled a giant disc with a bite taken out of the bottom. It had yellow, orange, and blue lights with intricate markings and a dark circle in the center. As it hovered over the woods, it seemed to expand and get smaller again. We could see it pulsing as if it were starting up, and then it just went. It came really close at one stage, and I thought it was going to land in the field. You can hear me on the video saying, wow, it was like nothing I'd ever seen before. Back to the skeptics for a second. Skeptics believe that all of the sightings, and I mean, there are a ton of sightings, hundreds of sightings in the Matlock Triangle, but they say that all of the sightings are the results of planes traveling to and from Manchester Airport and nothing else. But I don't buy that. How can hundreds of residents, residents who live there, who see these planes take off and land every day, how are they the same people seeing the UFOs and not knowing what they're seeing? 
not knowing the difference between like a plane and a UFO. It just doesn't make any sense to me. I could get it if like tourists were there. They didn't know there was an airport nearby. They'd never seen any airplanes like those people in that M. Night Shyamalan movie, The Village. But otherwise, no, bullshit. I call bullshit to skeptics saying that these hundreds, and I mean hundreds, not 100, hundreds of UFO sightings are all known aircrafts taking off or landing at Manchester Airport. Nope. Okay, we have one final triangle for this episode. It's the Michigan Triangle. That's right. My hometown triangle that I never even knew about when I lived in Michigan. And I'm, and I'm pretty sure I'm about to debunk it for you right now. Now, it's a big triangle. It goes over a stretch of Lake Michigan. This one, this triangle, started in the 19th century. So it's been around a while when boats would frequently go missing on the lake. Now, let me pause right here to say that storms come up fast and strong on the Great Lakes. So it's not unusual to me yet. One famous quote unquote victim of the triangle was the Rosa Bell, a double masted vessel, which was found capsized on the lake with no trace of the crew. Her ruptured stern indicated that she had been rammed by another vessel, but no other ship was ever reported and there was no accident reported about it. Okay, that's a little strange. I'll give you that. But it's also untrue. The Coast Guard looked over the wreckage and said no collision was involved in her downing. She was sunk because of a storm and nothing else. Very easy, very scientific, very common problem in the Great Lakes. Then, in 1937, Captain George Donner vanished from a freighter sailing through the triangle after going into his cabin and asked to be awoken in a few hours. That is all true. His crew went down to get him, and he was gone, just boof, gone. And they said they have no idea what happened to him. It's as, if, it's as if he vanished. Probably did vanish. He probably fell overboard. A very common thing that happened in the Great Lakes all the time, especially back then. Now, it's not just boats. Planes go down in the Triangle, too. But again, always involving storms. Like Flight 2501. On June 23rd, 1950, Northwest Airlines Flight 2501 was on its way from New York to Minneapolis at the hands of an experienced pilot, Robert C. Lind. He was carrying 58 passengers. Due to bad weather, when the flight was near Chicago, it changed course and turned over Lake Michigan. Around midnight, Lind requested permission to drop altitude from 3,500 feet to 2,500 feet without ever specifying a reason. His request was denied and that was the last communication Flight 2501 ever had. Debris and body parts were found, but never the full wreckage. Guess what they were headed into when they radioed in? If you said a storm, you are correct. There are a ton of websites that say that nothing was ever found in this plane, that it poof, just disappeared. They said the second he asked to go from 3,500 feet to 2,500 feet, he disappeared. The plane didn't appear on radar. Poof, it just vanished. That is not true. They found debris. They found body parts. They just didn't find the full wreckage. It's that kernel of truth again. Sure, it sounds mysterious, but he was headed right into a storm. A storm that they could find, that they can prove existed. So, just because there's a triangle doesn't mean it's paranormal. The Michigan Triangle is most easily explainable triangle on this list but that's also why I added it. It's listed on every site as being so mysterious and paranormal when it's just not. Look at the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. It's a very popular song by Gordon Lightfoot. You can listen to the whole damn thing. That entire ship was brought down because of a storm. Storms come up out of nowhere on the Great Lakes and take down ships since recorded time. Take down planes since recorded time. Obviously, we've been recording since planes have been around, but it's been an... It's it's been a known issue that still goes on to this day. These storms come up. They come up fierce. They come up strong. They take down ships. They take down planes. It is just not paranormal. So I'm kind of ending on a downer of a triangle, but I did that on purpose. The Bermuda Triangle is mostly debunked. There are still some weird things that are seen in the Bermuda Triangle. Don't get me wrong. I am not debunking fully the Bermuda Triangle. There's a lot of weird crap that's still seen out there, but a lot of it is explained. 
this Michigan Triangle, everything I can find about it, everything can be explained scientifically. And I think that is just as important because what it leaves, it leaves these other triangles that I cannot explain, not even remotely explain. How can there be hundreds of UFO sightings over one triangle? How can another triangle have ghosts and Bigfoot and Thunderbirds and UFOs and everything, the gambit of paranormal stuff? Some of these triangles just cannot be explained scientifically. I wholeheartedly say that swamp gas is not the explanation for everything seen in the Hockamock Swamp. I call bullshit on that one. Magnetic anomalies, they do happen over the Dragon's Triangle, or in the Dragon's Triangle, just like they do in Bermuda Triangle. We don't know what it is yet, but I've been saying this since the beginning. My hope is that science gets to a point where science can prove or debunk the paranormal. And I think it's going to prove it more than it debunks it. Because there's a lot of things that are unexplained right now that I think eventually science is going to explain. All right, so that about does it for triangles on this episode. Surprisingly, there are more triangles out there. This is just a little bit of the triangles that are out there, but there are more triangles to talk about in future episodes. So let me ask you this. Would you go in to any of these triangles? Would you go into the Hockamock Swamp? Would you take a canoe into the Hockamock Swamp? Do you believe that the Bermuda Triangle is real? Do you think that science has disproved the Bermuda Triangle? If you had to go into, had to go into one of these triangles on this episode, which triangle would it be? Once again, I'm your host, Kurt Samvig, and this has been another edition of Paranormal Almanac. Triangle Man, Triangle Man, Triangle Man, he's part of I'm looking out. I'm looking out. I'm looking out.